Open our Bibles then at John 17. This uh, unique, uh, amazing prayer of our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, may we uh, benefit still from this prayer and uh, may God speak to us. We continue in worship, we bow and ask God to help us. Father, then we turn to your word. Lord, we come and we come to holy ground, the prayer of thy Son. Father, we pray uh, that uh, you would speak to us. And Lord, we would know you and know something more of your great name. We ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, in John 17, uh, we come uh, to surely the greatest prayer uh, that's ever been prayed. Uh, it's uh, on the cusp of the greatest event in the entire history of the world. We're on the cusp of the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the night of his betrayal. It's the climax of his public ministry, climax of the greatest message ever declared to the world that God has given his Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And in this prayer uh, is a provision uh, for the greatest experience ever to be known by any man, woman, or boy and girl that we might know People like us might know the only God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. And we might know God because Jesus prays that we might know God. What a prayer it is. And all of that is possible because of what we looked at last week, verse 4. Um, I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And so Jesus, as he sees the cross ahead of him, uh, for him it's finished. Uh, for him, he's, he's, he's on the cross and he's beyond the cross. Uh, and for the joy that's set before him, he endures the cross because uh, there's glorification. He's glorified at the cross. God, his Father, is glorified. And salvation is one for his people. So it's a finished work, um, and he rescues sinners. Uh, and that's all of last week. Uh, and this morning, as we continue in this prayer, we find that the work of Jesus uh, as is indeed a rescuing work and a saving work and a finished work, uh, we find this morning that his work is a revealing work. In Jesus, the Son of God, God's name is revealed. That's verse 6. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world, Thine they were, thou gavest them to me, and they have kept thy word. I have manifested, I have displayed your name. Um, and as we will see in a little while, and this is not the only reference to name in John 17. It's a big, it's a big thing. And as we said to the children, uh, Jesus hasn't come into the world just to reveal that God is called God. It's, this is not about a label for him. 
The name of God is his entire person. And, you know, his disciples earlier in John, we beheld his glory. What sort of glory? The only, uh, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father. And, and all of grace and truth and, and who God is, we beheld him. So Jesus prays here um, from verse 6 on uh, for quite a while. He prays for his disciples. And he prays uh, that they, they, they would know his name and his name has been revealed to them. Not just a badge, but the whole character, the whole personality. And uh, Jesus has come to reveal who God is and God's being, his God's essence, God's attributes. Would you know God? Well, you need to look at Jesus Christ. You know, verse 3 is true, and clearly it is. Verse 3, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God. And we need to know his name. You, you know, you cannot put your trust in, in someone that you don't know. We're not called to put our faith in, in the promises of, uh, of, of a God who's some sort of concept or a theological idea. God is real. And, and Jesus comes and in his ministry, he has revealed God, his name, who he is. And so we read on to verse 12. Uh, just take you to verse 11 and 12. Uh, and now I'm no more in the world, but these are in the world. I come to thee, Holy Father, Keep through thine own name. You've got to keep these in the power of your name. Verse 12, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. And as Jesus uh, concludes um, this prayer, verse 26, and I have declared unto them thy name. So, here in John 17, uh, Jesus prays that all his disciples might know God's name. The disciples of his day, the disciples of every generation since. And that includes you and I, if we're Christians this morning. You need to know God's name, his essence, his very being. So that's, that's, that's going to take more than one sermon. <laughs> that's going to take more than a lifetime. But here in John 17, um, Jesus sets out uh, at least three things um, that, that just identify who God is. And, and knowing these things about God uh, will be a great strength to us and a help to us in, in our life. Uh, Jesus will say, I pray for them. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm leaving the world, but these ones are going to be left in the world. And they need to know your name. You, they need to know who you are if they are to survive in the world. So, three aspects of God's name, God's essence, God's being. First of all, in verse 6 then. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, thou gavest them to me, and they have kept thy word. Now, if we're told anything about God in verse 6, then we're surely told this, that God is sovereign over all things. He he rules over, over all things. Uh, he, he does as he pleases. Um, and he's sovereign in every aspect of life. 
And explicitly here in verse 6, he is sovereign over salvation. And so let's just unpack what Jesus tells us about uh, uh, those who are saved. In verse 6, um, um, and I'm not suggesting that we'll fully be able to grasp all this, but it's here, and it's the way it is. And so in verse 6, Jesus says that before the world was, before the foundation of the world was ever laid, uh, the Father, God the Father, took a people. Those people were not yet born. Uh, if you're a Christian this morning, they included you. And uh, he, he took a people unto himself out of the world before the world was, and he gave them to his Son to save and to keep. Um, now, you can spend a lot of time in verse 6, but I don't think you, you can reasonably come to any other conclusion than that. God saves whom he saves. He's chosen a people before the foundation of the world. I mean, many other places in the Bible will, will make the same truth known. He's sovereign. That's what he does. It's part of his being. He's, he, he's Lord of all. Um, and while that's made plain in verse 6, it's also made plain in verse 2. Uh, as thou hast given him power, that's uh, the him is Jesus, the Son, over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And verse 6 tells us that they were given to Jesus before the world ever was. And that's, that's part of the name of God. Um, he's sovereign. Incidentally, uh, you might be asking the question, how do I know if I'm one of those? Um, many, many people ask that. Uh, well, you can know if you're one of those because you will have believed in Jesus Christ. Um, and from our position, we are called to repent and believe. And, and what God has done is, well, that's, that's for God. And, you, you know, if, if, if you're going to believe in God, you need to believe in a God who's revealed in the Word of God and who's revealed in Jesus Christ and the only God there is is a sovereign God. And he has, he has no intention to consult with any of us. He, you know, he doesn't, there, he doesn't come to us for advice. We don't have any counsel to give God. You know, if, at times we think, you know, if I was God, I would do it some, some other way. Um, but then, very quickly, it dawns on us, but I'm not God. God is God. And, and he needs none of us. You know, friend, don't ever think when you arrive in heaven, God's going to say, oh, great, glad you came. I was getting lonely. Oh, I needed you. He needs none of us. He's entirely self-sufficient from all eternity past. He's the sovereign ruler of the skies. He's the potter. He's not a clay. He's the Lord God Almighty. Jesus has come to reveal him. Do you know him? Do you know him? You can put your trust in this God. He's, he's never going to let you down. There's never anything that's going to surprise him. There's never going to be anything or anyone that's more powerful that will, that will overrule him, that will tie God down. He's, he's God Almighty, and he's sovereign. He does as he pleases, and everything he does is good. He doesn't need nor ask for your advice or mine. And Jesus comes and I've manifested thy name. I've revealed thy character. 
unto these men, disciples, and they know that you are sovereign, ruler, God Almighty. That's what we need to know first about God. And then if I take you to verse 11, which is uh, another verse that mentions his name, uh, we learn this secondly. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father. You know, the only God, the God who creates all things, a God who is sovereign and rules, and Jesus reveals him. And the God whom Jesus reveals is holy. And our friend, we need to be reminded of that because uh, in great sways of the church, the idea that God is holy has just fallen off the radar. And there is no fear of God before their eyes. Holy, um, it speaks of purity. It speaks of uh, otherness, <laughs> that, he's, that he's other than us. Uh, he's, he's a purer eyes than to look upon evil. He, there is in him no sin, not one blemish in his character. The angels cover their faces from him because he's holy. He's robed in majesty, and he's a consuming fire. Do you know him? He speaks, and the mountains quake. The angels in his presence never cease to sing, Holy, holy, holy. That's his name. It's... It's who he is. It's not all that he is. But you, you cannot know God if your God is not holy and almighty and pure. Holy is his name. And we meet him. We gather this morning in awe. And we don't just... We don't roll out of bed and roll into church. I think we meet God. We're not here to meet our mates. We meet him. And if it was true in the days of the early church that there was no fear of God in their eyes, then... That's more so true today. Jesus has come to reveal your name, and he's holy. Jesus addresses his Father as Holy Father. You know, there are parts of Christendom, so-called, that believe that Holy Father is the name of a man in a frock in the Vatican. You know, it's a blasphemous thing to take the name of God and to apportion it to a man. He's Holy Father. And he, I say again, he's revealed God's name. It's, it's not simply that Jesus has come to reveal that God is I am. I am that I am, although that's part of how he declared himself way back in Exodus. It's, it's not that Jesus has come and said, 
that you need to know that God's name is Yahweh, although it is, or Jehovah Jireh, although it is, but it's his essence, and he's sovereign, and he is holy. That's the one we need to know. And thirdly, and still, of course, in verse 11, he's Father. He's Holy Father. And <laughs> there are so many people who don't get that. And so God is it's either or, isn't it? I mean, he's either holy or he's a loving, tender, gracious father. He can't be both. I mean, this is God. He's holy, and he's the sovereign ruler of the skies, and you're telling me he's a tender, loving father. I am, because that's what he is. And the world can't compute it. But our God's name is both. He's, he's sovereign ruler. Uh, he's, he's not a tyrant. He's holy. He's God who's apart, and, uh, apart from us, but he's with us. He is Father, loving, gracious, tender, caring, knows our frame. Jesus, keep them through thy name. One has said about these, this verse 11, that in two small words, two little words, Jesus reveals how big is our God. Do you know him? Holy, but he's Father, full of grace. And we're on the cusp of the cross. You know, how can you deny that God is love? How can you deny the love of God as he sends his son, his only son, to the cross? You know, context is everything. John 17 is on the cusp of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Why is he going there? Because God is love. He's Father. He's holy. I have manifested. I've revealed thy name. The great revealing of God is in Jesus' Son. Um, let me take you back uh, to John 14. As we go back to John 14, we're still uh, in this farewell discourse. We're still the night of his betrayal, of course. This is where it starts in John 14. Um, show us the way, <laughs> let not your heart be troubled, um, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and so on, is all there in John 14, and, and verse 8, Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it suffice us. Jesus says unto him, have I been so long with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. How on earth can you see? How sayest thou? Show us the Father. I've come to reveal the Father. You look at Jesus Christ and you study him and you see God, everything we need to know about God, revealed in the face of Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 1, uh, if you're able to find uh, Colossians, and uh, you know, after Jesus' death and resurrection, and, and after Pentecost, and the Spirit's given, and the apostles are sent out to the world, and the church is established, um, but, but they're still, who is, who is Jesus? And, and how do we have the Lord our God is one, and, and but we have Jesus the Son and the Father and the Spirit. How is all that? How are we meant to understand that? And they struggled. 
And so the church was taught in Colossians 1.15, Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God. That's who he is. Immortal, invisible, God only wise. But Jesus has revealed him. He's the, the icon. That's the word. <laughs> He's the icon, the very icon of the invisible God. Uh, over the page, or Colossians 2, verse 9. For in him, Jesus, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's who he is. Back in John's Gospel. Uh, I'll take you back to John 1 uh, and um, how he was introduced. In John 1, 12. Um, But as many as believed on him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. It's, it's his character. It's who he is. He's the express image of the Father. He's the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. Verse 18 of John 1. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him or revealed him. So Jesus, uniquely, we thought last week of John 17, this prayer, it's uniquely Jesus' prayer. But he's our model. He reveals the name, the character of God because Jesus is uniquely God and man. And so we return to John 17, and it's a unique prayer. But it's a prayer of Jesus, our model, and he says, follow me. Last week, John 17, verse 4, I've finished the work, we thought, but there's a work for us to finish. There's a work for Jesus only you can do. Jesus has come to reveal God to a lost world, but Jesus has returned to the Father. But in verse 11, uh, he's praying for his disciples. And now I'm no more in the world. I mean, he's already looking to the cross and, and his resurrection. I'm no more in the world. This work is finished. But these are in the world. <laughs> and friend, if you're a disciple this morning, <laughs> you're still in the world. And there's a world that needs to have God revealed to them. And that's what you're meant to be doing. That's what I'm meant to be doing. These are in the world. I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name your power, your sovereign power, your majesty, your person. Keep them. Those whom thou hast given to me, they may be one as we are one. His disciples, Christians, are in the world. Why? So that we might reveal God's name to a lost world. How are we going to do that? Unity. Unity. A unity of love. which is something that Jesus has already mentioned. i take you back to John 13. John 13, 34, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, by your love for one another, shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Jesus has come at the end of his work, a work that is finished. I've finished the work you gave me to do, uh, and it's a saving work, and it's a rescuing work. But in verse 6, he makes known that his work was a revealing work. I have come 
have manifested and have revealed your name, that, that my disciples might know who you are, your very essence, your being, all your attributes, your sovereign ruler, you're holy and you're pure and you're other. You're not like, you're not a man that you should lie. You're other and you're pure and you're without blemish and you're holy and you, your home is heaven by your father. You're a father to your children, loving, merciful, gracious, abundant in pardon. I've come to reveal who you are to the world. Do you know him? I mean, this is life eternal. Do you know who God is? And you, and you, and you know his name. It's not simply that God is called God. It's not that. Is who God is, do you know him? And if you know him, then Jesus calls you to go and make his name known to others. Tell them. There's no other name. There's no other name that saves. There's no other name that, that, that is love inexpressible. And you can join all the names in the world, but they don't come close. No other name comes close than the name of our God and all his person, his being, and his essence. And he's come, Jesus has come, that we might know whom we believe in. Hallelujah that he's come. Praise God. May we know our God. Amen. Father God, how we thank you for who you are. And we thank you that Jesus has come and declared and revealed and made manifest who you are. You're not a mystery to us. But Lord, by faith and through the work of Jesus Christ, who we know you and we know that you're a God of love who has given your son to save us. We thank you in his precious name. Amen. We're going to sing 136, join all the glorious names of wisdom, love, and power that ever mortals knew, the angels ever bore. All are too mean to speak his worth, too mean to set my Savior forth. He is the image of the invisible God. In Jesus dwells the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. He's a name a name higher than other names. There's no name like him. Let's stand and sing 136.
blessing and honor, uh, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God, to his precious name forever and ever. Amen.